and go. All right, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'll call this committee adjustment hearing to order. Um, before we start this evening, I'm just gonna go through the committee's uh, protocols for tonight. We have seven applications involving four different properties that we'll be hearing, um, and the following will be kind of the procedure that we're gonna follow. Um, housekeeping rule before we start, if you have cell phones, if you can please put them on mute or silent mode or turn them off, great. Um, for anyone that comes forward to make a presentation or ask questions, the podium is right for that purpose. Um, if you can address any question that you have to the chair, not directly to the person who you asked the question, it'd be great. Um, the first order of business will be to ask any members if they have conflicts of interest with any of the applications that we'll be hearing tonight. Following that, uh, request for any deferrals or withdrawals of applications on the agenda. Secretary Treasurer will, Treasurer will then read out each application uh, with a brief staff uh, description and report and recommendation. The applicant or the agent for the applicant will then be asked to come forward. Again, the podium on the right, for the, your left, my right. Uh, introduce themselves, be allowed a short overview explaining any further details or additional information with regards to the application uh, being made if they desire. Then we'll open the floor to committee members to ask any questions that they have of the applicant. Um, and then following that, we'll ask, open the floor to members of the public that wish to speak to any applications. I don't know if we have anyone on the line. Okay. Um, any members of the public wishing to speak to an application will be asked to come forward, state their name and address for the record, uh, try to limit their comments to 10 minutes and must present all questions or comments that they have that's pertinent to the application uh, before us. And the variances or, um, I don't think we have any severances tonight, but any uh, variances that we have. Uh, in that time frame, per persons making a presentation uh, need to um, say everything in that 10 minutes because they may not necessarily be allowed to return again to speak on the same application. Um, and when I say applications, typically we go by property, so there is one uh, this evening has four um, applications for the products. Following all comments, the applicant will be afforded some closing comments if desired. The committee will then present a decision in the form of a motion. The motion will be discussed and voted upon. The vote is tied, a motion will be defeated, and a new motion will be made. Well, if, uh, defeated motions, if the motion sorry, is defeated, new motions will be made until a decision has been reached. Notices of decision will only be provided to those persons who leave their name and addresses in writing with the Secretary Treasurer. There's a table at the back for that purpose for anyone that's in attendance. Um, also, if anyone's watching online and wish to be notified of the decision, um, they can email teateraba at t-a-y-a period t-a-r-a-b-a at portcobra.ca immediately following uh, the meeting or they can call 905-835-2900, extension 204, immediately following the hearing and leave a message. It should also be noted that only, in order to be kept advised of any possible Ontario Land Tribunal hearings, persons must request to be sent a copy of the committee's decision on an application. So that's the protocol for this evening. I will uh, look to see if there's any conflicts of interest this evening. Eric? Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, I have, uh, I declare an indirect pecuniary, pecuniary interest on items or applications A13-24-PC, A14-24-PC, A15-24PC, A16-24PC, as uh, the applicant is, is it, uh, my employer, Sorry, the applicant is a client of my employer. Okay. Um, so I will then look for any um, requests for deferrals of applications. First, I'll go to the uh, audience here for anyone that's in attendance or the applicants that are in attendance. I know we have one applicant that's online that has notified us that they wish to defer their application. Um, so if we could bring that person in, just confirm.
feedback if you have multiple <laughs> They're gonna have to turn down their speaker because it's. If you turn down your speaker, then we might be able to hear you better. Now it looks like you have your microphone on mute.
any members of the committee wish to ask any questions? Not seeing any. Is there any members of the public that wish to ask any questions on this particular application? Not seeing any. And you said you want to on So with that, I will turn to the members for recommendation here. Through you, I would like to ask a question. You know, sure. So uh, through you, Mr. Chair, to the applicant. Uh, your application referred to the purpose of the uh, request being for a command cave. Mm -hmm. um, will the will it be an additional dwelling unit? Or will it? What's going to be up there? So basically, I, I just mean I wanted a bathroom and stuff like that for now. Just that, and then eventually, like you now, I might be doing like some woodworking as I get a little bit older and stuff like that. Okay. Will there be windows? That would be overlooking to the neighbor, neighboring property. Uh, one small window, and it will be a window in the front of the like a garage facing the road right now. Thank you. Anything else? Recommendation. Gary? Uh, thank you, Mr. Mr. <laughs> Mr. Chair. Uh, application 81024PC. Plans legally known as Lot 61 on Plan 74 under Plan 888, First Density Residential I1 Zone. The minor grants application 81024 PC be granted for the following reasons. One, the application is minor in nature. Two, it is appropriate for the development of the site. Three, it is desirable in compliance with the general, general purpose of the zoning bylaw. And four, it is desirable in compliance with the general, general purpose of the official plan. Thank you. Second, there's that. Questions or comments? All those in favor? Uh, we carry. Thank you. There's a, I guess, please. There is a 20 day waiting period. But following that, uh, you should go get your permit to start the process. Okay. Do I stay or do I get uh, You can stay. You can go. <laughs> okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Madam Secretary, the next application. Our next application is Minor Barrett's application A1224PC for the lands municipally known as 323 Road in the rural RU zone as established in the zoning bylaw. The owner, Sarah Schaefer, is requesting relief for the provisions of the zoning bylaw to permit the creation of an addition on the existing attached dwelling, notwithstanding the following. That the minimum interior side yard setback of 1.52 meters be permitted, whereas a minimum of 5 years is required. Given the information in the recommendation report, planning staff recommends that application A1224PC be granted as the application is minor in nature, is appropriate for the development of the site, is desirable in compliance with the general intent and purpose of the zoning bylaw, and is desirable in compliance with the general intent and purpose of the official plan. That concludes correspondence for this application. Thank you. Is the applicant here this evening? Please come on up. Same process as previous. Members of the public that wish to speak to this application. Yeah, I have 
I've never done to, this before, so I'm... For, for, so you can just go to the podium on the side, have the applicant step aside, just so we can hear you and your name and record, okay. name and address for the record. And we don't fight. You don't fight? I'll yeah. go back. <laughs> what do I do? Just tell it's, it's already on, so you're good to go. So just your name and address for the record, and you may proceed. My name is Antonella Ricci. My address, you want? Yes, please. 26 Homewood Avenue, Port Colburn. But it's regarding the property off. Mm -hmm. one point. So um, can I just ask my question? Or? Go ahead. Okay, sure. I've never done this before, so I just need to know how that, how this application is going to affect my property and why is it being asked for? Why is it not just being built to, to code and why is she asking for the variance? I, I can answer generally. Sure. I don't know the reason. Specifically, why do they want to build an addition? Yeah, is it a big and addition? Is it, it so? So the addition is going to go to the south, I believe. Um, and the reason being is, if they go to the north, they'll be on to uh, environmentally sensitive area on the property. So the only spot that they could go would be to the south, but the file would be requires, anywhere. Which way? Towards where? It'd be towards the lake. Towards, towards the lake. Okay. Yes. On that side. So there was a sketch with the application. Yeah, I know. It just this doesn't make sense to me. I mean, this is the first time I've ever looked at this. Um, I just need to know, basically, does it affect our property? Will it come onto our property when no. it wants to build? No. So, okay. The, the, whatever they're going to build has to stay completely on their property. Okay. But they want to come closer to our property Correct. line? The bylaw requires, I believe it's eight meters. Five, five meters. Five meters. And they're requesting... 1.52? One that exactly one point five two. Okay, so, so this will be one point five two meters away from here to the property line. Okay, but why not five? Why, I don't get it. Why not stick with the five? That's, that's, the what, the, that's what they're asking for, and that's what they're seeking. Okay, and what if I deny that? Like what? Like, uh, you don't get to deny it. You can okay. provide comments. Okay. To the I'm just trying to understand, like yeah. why why these letters? If you can just do it, then why not just do it? Why send these letters out? With, because where they want to put the proposed addition, they can't build there with yeah. the variance. The bylaw does not allow it. They can't build there. Okay. Correct. But so they're now they're asking for 1.52. And Correct. it won't affect my property at all. In the future, if I want to sever or sell, the person that buys it won't say, hey, this person has built their building too close. But the purpose of this meeting is to bring the property into compliance. So when they build there, basically reducing on that particular property, reducing that setback to what they've asked for. Okay. Or whatever we grant. Okay. Is that, that's all I need to know. If it will affect future sale of my property. Like he brought up too, like will there be windows? Are they going to be looking down on property on our side? Is it going to be closer than normal? So if those are all your concerns, <coughs> I, I will leave the applicant maybe address some of those um, if, if she wishes. Okay. Um, as, as far as that particular issue goes, we don't have a lot of view there. We do have some, but um, if that's a concern, then certainly the committee can discuss that. Okay. Discuss okay. So, uh, I'll go to Eric and I don't know if you have a question for the presenter. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Chair, if, if you're concerned about your property, um, I would recommend getting a survey and then you know exactly where your property is. Oh, I know where my property line is. I just. Well, we have a sketch here. What's that? <coughs> okay. That's it. We're done. We're done. If you have no further questions, uh, I don't. Just can you answer some of that? I, I have no idea who you are. This is my direct neighbor. <laughs> yeah. This well, is the neighbor of the property that I'm. Yeah, I don't know. Just got this letter. This is the. Uh, where? Where like are what you? What street are you? We're on uh, right off the one four. No, I know. We're Snyder Road. That's the property that's. Yeah, our property is not behind us. No. Okay. No. Oh, oh, no. If, if I might, okay. we're, we're not going to get into an all out discussion here. If you've asked your questions, yeah. the, the applicant can maybe address some of your concerns. It sounds like you probably won't even see what's going on there because they're on Snyder Road as opposed to. Yeah. It's just that their property yeah. extends all the way back to Highway. This is Highway 140. Yeah. yeah, that's like us on 140. Yes. That's right. So you probably won't even see what they're going to do. You probably can't even see their house. Yeah, you can't see it. Not nowhere near us. It's nowhere near you guys. <laughs> that's why I was like, oh, this answers the question. We're not anywhere near them. So. Yeah, fair. Okay. So, so if you want to. If you want to uh, address any of those, excuse me. Hello. Hello. Okay. 
If you want to discuss it, you can go into the hallway. But okay. So if, if you want to address any of those, feel free to address any of those questions. What we're doing will not impact the property at all. Okay. Is there any other members of the public that wish to speak to this application? <laughs> Sir? Uh, again, just come forward, name and address for the record. The, the microphone's already on, so you're, you're good. Just name and address for the record. And yeah, my name is uh, Sibrin He. I'm right next to them. Okay. Uh, 32, 19, I only have a simple question, actually. Uh, how, uh, how close will their new addition be to to the to the property line? So the request the request is 1.5 meters on their side. Yeah. Okay. I have no problem there. Okay. Uh, how how uh, how do we know where the property line is? <laughs> well, I, I guess to the previous comment from our committee member here is uh, that's more of a civil matter. In a adjustment pattern. Um, if, if they've had the property surveyed or you have the property surveyed, there should be stakes, and uh, I'll leave it at that. But um, based on the information we're given, the assumption is the property lines are known, and if there's a dispute, then it becomes a civil matter where your property line is versus where your property line is. I, I just thought that uh, the print that uh, for Golden City Hall made up was pretty small, sure. what we got in the mail, yep. and, it, and it did. I couldn't figure out. Well, what the distance is from the, the new addition to the property line. But the, the print was so small, so couldn't even tell uh, how many feet it is. It is it within that 1.52 meter, which is about five feet? Yes. It is? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. That's where you found me. Perhaps the applicant does have a survey, and so that'd be the shared line. I'm not sure that they do, but if they did, you'd be able to. It's a common boundary between the two of these. Yeah, well, I, I can talk to both of them. Great. I'll need one out. Yeah. I love the idea. Thank you. Thank you. Is there Angie, you have a question? Okay. Is there anyone else from the audience who wishes to speak to this application this evening? Not seeing anything else. Is there any further questions or comments you have? Or no. You know that? Okay. So, Angie, I'll <coughs> Application A1224 BC, uh, legally known as uh, Hungerstone Concession 4, Part Lot 22, Part 26, on registered plan 59R 9658, uh, located in, in the rural zone. Uh, that my variance application A1224 PC be granted for the following reasons. One, the application is minor in nature. Two, it is appropriate for the development of the site. Three, it is desirable and in compliance with the general intent of the purpose of the zoning bylaw. And four, it is desirable and in compliance with the general intent of, and purpose of the official plan. Thank you. Seconder to that. Dave, questions or comments? All those in favor? That'll be carried. Thank you. So again, just like the uh, previous applicant, there's a 20-day waiting period, um, and then following that, I think you can maybe start the application process for building permit, but you won't get it until after. Okay. And Madam Secretary, the last cluster of applications. Our last applications are minor variance applications A13-1, PC, A14-24, PC, a15-24 PC and A16-24 PC for the lands municipally known as 19 Lakeshore Road West in the first density residential R1 zone as established in the zoning bylaw. The agent Dylan Earl, on behalf of the owner, Leo DeFabio, requesting for relief from provisions of the zoning bylaw to permit the creation of a new building lot, notwithstanding the following. That the minimum lot area of 418 meters squared be permitted, whereas a maximum of 500 meters squared is required. Given the information in the recommendation reports, Planning staff recommend that these applications be granted as the applications are minor in nature, they are appropriate for the development of the site, they are desirable in compliance with the general intent and purpose of the zoning bylaw, and they are desirable in compliance with the general intent and purpose of the official plan. That concludes correspondence to this application. Thank you. The applicant here this evening. Our 
are straight in front of you there. Perfect. So I understand you have a little presentation you want to put together. So I'll just turn the floor to you for that. You might have to share that screen. Through the chair, my um, name is chair. Pearl. Just the one second. It's not coming through to where I can see it. Yep, I'm good. Okay, there you go. All good. Through the chair, I am Dylan Earl. Agent for 19 Lakeshore Road West. Um, the application is for minor variance on an already approved severance for reducing the lot area. And this is across the four lots. So this is the proposal with the four parcels. Uh, two parcels front onto Lakeshore Road and two parcels are on Hampton Ave. This is the subject parcel highlighted. Uh, current use is residential. It has an existing single detached home and a carriage house at the back. Uh, the current regional official plan is within the built up area and the current zoning is R1. Okay. This is just a, a quick recap of the zoning requirements. Uh, so I already submitted this uh, severance application through to this committee in the past. Uh, so the reason this minor variance is coming up now is uh, through our pre-consultation, I was told it was R2, so that's the reason I'm here today is because it's actually R1, so I need to uh, get the minor variance. As you can see, if it were in R2, the minimum is 400 meters squared. We're not R2, we're R1, so I'm looking to reduce that 500 to the 418. Uh, as mentioned, I did bring a severance application here before. Uh, it has been recently approved by the Ontario Land Tribunal. Um, so just wanted to bring that to your attention. This is strictly minor variance for lot area. This is the proposal superimposed on an aerial. And then go down. This is just an example uh, of our lot grading and drainage plan just to show that the site does function with dwellings and drainage and everything. This is it enlarged. Uh, I won't go through the details, but it's there for reference. Uh, some things I would like to mention is uh, lot coverage and landscaped areas uh, are important for owners and those are uh, adequate. So the lot area is the only thing that's deficient. So notes that I want to uh, highlight from my experience from last time, uh, even though it might not speak specifically to the technical requirements of a minor variance, but I just want to provide some support for the application with regard to character, fit, desirability. Uh, so character, you know, that looks at things like the build form. We're proposing detached dwellings. They're not towns. They're not mid-rise or duplexes or triplexes or anything like that. These are detached dwellings. Uh, massing and height are appropriate, two-story. Uh, we may even sell the lots to a builder who wants to do a single story. We're not sure, but uh, the site can accommodate a two-story house. Uh, lots of yard and landscaping amenity space. In terms of the fit, uh, the setbacks on Hampton uh, will be better than neighbors and existing with this application. For example, our carriage house, I think, is sitting right on the property line, whereas this sets us back six meters, which is great. Or 6.5, sorry. And Lakeshore uh, road-wise, uh, we do exceed the minimum uh, front yard. But again, uh, this application is strictly lot area. I just want to speak to the, the overall um, project. And then the desirability. Uh, we're going to use quality materials, design features, and lot configurations with driveway so it doesn't feel like it's squished in there. It's, it's an appropriate design. 
Here's an example of a dwelling uh, that this is what we use to calculate for drainage, etc. If you scroll down, we've actually built it. It performs well. Uh, that may not necessarily be what we build, but it's just an example. Here I've highlighted the front yard setbacks. Um, again, just really want to demonstrate the fit and how it will be with the streetscape and homogeneous. Here I've outlined the uh, building envelopes or the, the, the structures. And if we go down, you can see compared to neighbors, uh, in terms of the streetscape, the fabric, it's fairly consistent. Almost, you know, it's only three meters different from our neighbor on the one side. But, you know, our, we don't have a sidewalk on our side, so it's not like it's, you know, right there in your face. There's a sidewalk there, but uh, not on our side. So I just want to emphasize that the streetscape is appropriate. So just to recap, this is the current subject property. That's the carriage house at the back on Hampton. And this is the, the house in the middle on Lakeshore. So in conclusion, uh, you know, we meet the four tests for the variance. Again, the <coughs> area is in keeping with the official plan, zoning bylaw, desirable, minor in nature. We've already received support from Ontario Land, Tri Land Tribunal for the severance, knowing of our layout. The Niagara region and the city planning staff agree and support this development. And that is all. Thank you. Thank you. Is there any questions of the uh, applicants even? Okay. Thank you, Chair. Through the applicant. Can you scroll back up? Go, go, go a little bit farther. Um, maybe it was the first slide that you had. Okay. Um, Right here, I guess is a good one. With the four parcels, um, the service is run on Hampton. There is there is water, but it's across the road on Lakeshore. How do you service all four with the services on Hampton? So through the chair, we could pull a sanitary uh, lateral down Lakeshore Road, uh, and we. Coordinated with Adam Machka, uh, Development Management Planning, uh, and the Engineering Department to make sure that it's uh, achievable. So, sorry, so you're going to run your own sanitary sewer down Lakeshore? Uh, through the chair, where the individual landowners would be responsible up to the property line, but in order to get the services to the property line from the city side, Yes, the developer or the owner would have to pay to extend the sewer lateral under the city road down to Lakeshore Road. Or alternatively, an easement could be sought after to bring services off the back of Hampton, which would be desirable, but I think the approach is to rely on the Lakeshore Road sanitary lateral instead. So I guess that sent off some question marks with me when you said that you might sell the lots off um, and you're not going to develop them yourself so if you sell the lots will the buyer beware that they have to service them themselves and if they don't want to run the sanitary down Lakeshore Road and go for an easement they may run into problems with the people that front, the two lots that front on Hampton with regards to an easement to their property. Through the chair, uh, yes, excellent points. Uh, however, the goal is to sell them. I don't know what the buyer pool for people with unserviceability is. Obviously not great, so there's no burden on the municipality to provide these services. It's on, in our interest as the developer to provide services to prospective buyers. So if you don't get easements over them, then that, then that only allows the two, the two parcels in front of the way shore one option. So that's correct, as is <coughs> all properties. But the, the sanitary is not there to tap into. 
where would you, where would you tie in the sanitary if you're coming down Lakeshore Road? Uh, the, so it's on Lakeshore Road. It's just not in front of our house. I think it's two houses down. That's where it terminates, or it's just not extended to us. So we'd be responsible for pulling it in front of our dwelling or our property. Okay. I wonder if staff could comment on that. Does that leave the city in any predicament? Generally, though, they're not this situation, this particular situation where they back onto the rear street. I, it, my concern is I could easily see that without an estimate, the cost of extending a city main and the turnover of it, or potentially the city saying, like on Barrett Road, where the services and or a sanitary ended for the person to put the extra two lots in. They had not only had this signed agreement, but off the end demand hole, you can look up the, uh, uh, the, the name, um, they had to, it was a lot more cost prohibitive after the fact. So they provide a private trunk um, out of the manhole. Uh, then there's an agreement on maintenance and liability agreement for the two houses. Like it was a lot more complicated than just paying the city to extend the main and then the laterals. I just want to make sure that, um, I'm not sure if I can ask the applicant this, would you mind doing a development agreement? Because at the end of the day, um, if you go front or back, as long as it's done and the city isn't impacted, uh, the owner, is never left in a lurch. And you're gone and we're left. And, and that's where the battle begins. And I think my colleague was trying to uh, prevent that too. And I, I certainly don't want to uh, add a burden to a potential new homeowner uh, as a welcoming or owner. Uh, through the chair, uh, if the development agreement is the correct mechanism, I'm not 100% sure. 
at this point we've identified with engineering department that they had no concerns through a plumbing only permit would be where securities would be posted and that type of work would be completed um, if it has to be done prior to completion of severances uh, then yeah I think that would be a condition uh, I'm not sure if it's development agreement but um, perhaps chief of planning can address that I just want to make sure the right mechanisms in place yes. yeah same here but but yeah I understand the objective is to ensure that servicing can adequately reach the lots without any burden placed on the municipality. I think that's the objective. Which, yeah, if it's controlled by condition of severance, that's fine. Through you to the chief planner, so how would uh, you suggest we ensure that either um, you know the cart doesn't come before the horse? How do we ensure that that is um, that the services are provided adequately? Because obviously the sale of the lots could come two or three years from now. And uh, because I'm incredibly concerned that if the rear houses are sold and the developer is nowhere to be found, or for that matter, does it need to be found to be sold the lots? And, and, uh, and I'm not saying that we, you're that type of uh, company that would do that. But I just want to provide protection for the two front lots and protection for the city. Through, through the chair to the, to the county member, I, I know um, Ms. Earl has been working closely with Adam and I do uh, in terms of uh, dealing with the, the servicing and getting the servicing uh, to the properties that will be to, to all four of them. Um, from Adam, uh, he has not indicated any concerns in terms of um, how to deal with this and how it proceeds. Uh, I, would, I would tend to lean on him if you had comments on the consent uh, stage, he would have indicated uh, the request for a development agreement. So I, I wouldn't recommend the need for one, uh, that we're in a position to, to, to work with the applicant to, to get the service in there and not um, and hinder the homes without, without servicing and not being sold. Sorry, I'm gonna, this is the old time for me. Uh, I used to live three or four doors down from here, and I was around when they put a water main down uh, Lakeshore Road West. It was delayed for a year and a bit because of uh, Archaeological issues. Um, there's no estimate for what a sanitary line would cost. There's no indication that it's a gravity sewer, and there's no indication that there's potentially artifacts. And so, uh, the the cost is an unknown. You don't know it, and if it balloons, um, you know. We're all left picking up the pieces afterwards. Um, I still like to find it sounds like the applicant is not adverse to providing a mechanism. It's not onerous. Um, it would seem to me maybe you put the services to the front lot through the back and you don't deal with all that stuff. But I think I think that the issue of it being serviceable. And the cost and side issues are two entirely different things. Cost of servicing is if everything goes well and it's a paper exercise and an estimate from a contractor. I don't think that figures into, I think the city uh, in it itself now knows it probably wouldn't have went up front with the water main as to what it cost. But um, again, um, you get into what that stretch of sanitary might cost. And it's anybody's guess, and, and I think it, like usually, it may be more than you think. So um, maybe it's the plumbing permit. I don't know if there's some language we could put in to this that um, that a further explanation. Like again, I agree with the developer and with you, uh, Denise. Uh, I said the word planning agreement off the cup with your development agreement, but it may be another way. Um, yeah. We could we could proceed and perhaps you could think up an appropriate. Uh, if, uh, yes, if through the chair, if, if you're comfortable, um, and, you're under, and the rest of um, the committee, um, we can look at the best options to ensure that the lots are serviced uh, appropriately before um, the sale of them. Um, if you Attaching a, attaching a condition to the, to the minor variance is not 
So. No, so the only thing you can go off now is that uh, with, with my comment that we will um, we will work on that and, and look at the best kind of mechanism to ensure that that happens. You can't put anything on title. If I might, to your point, even if you come up with a service agreement, now unless the agreement says they're going to have these services installed within the two years, the variance that's granted meets the condition of the severance, gets severed, and then you okay to have agreements and you get service done, but they never do. You're still in that same situation, number one. Just because you have an agreement that says you're going to sign an agreement doesn't mean they're going to actually execute the work. Second point, <laughs> true, I, I don't disagree. Second point is that if they severed these locks just into two as opposed to four, they wouldn't even be here today. Uh, and I think these points should have been raised at the initial meeting. To, to some point they were. Um, it didn't become a condition then. We denied the application, obviously. And from what I understand, the Ontario Land Tribunal went with the staff's report and whatever conditions were in the staff's report, that's what they entered in as the conditions of the OLT here, which, again, does require these uh, variances to be granted to meet the conditions of that. Um, so with that being said, I, I, it is a quandary because you can meet the condition, you get the variance, and you still don't get service. Now, if there is a mechanism that staff can address that particular purpose. Um, maybe if it's just say some some sort of agreement to ensure the user service. I don't know if you'd be able to get them service within the two years. Um, I'll go to the applicant on that point, but. Uh, through the chair, I think we need to differentiate between being serviceable and being serviced. Um, so in a cottage country, you can buy a vacant land, you put in a septic tank, but you're just going to be able to demonstrate that septic tank can go there. In this instance, engineering has confirmed that these lots are serviceable. As for when those lots get serviced, again, who knows, but it, I think the mechanism is perhaps the building permit. Like, they're not going to issue a building permit if there's no servicing. So at, at this stage of lot creation, we've confirmed with the engineering department that it's serviceable, and I, I think that's where it ends. I, I don't know if that so we all should say the building permit and we'd be out of your lunch. Anyone else have any other questions? <coughs> Not seen any. Okay, so I'll go to uh, members in the audience. If members of the public have any questions or comments with regards to these uh, applications, or is yours? Sir? You can come up to the side, your name and address for the record. <coughs> 10 minutes and please stay germane to the applications in front of us being the lock area of the potential parcels. Thank you. Uh, Eric Hughes. Um, I live at 5 Lakeshore Road, which would be um, two doors down from the property we're talking about 19. Um, I didn't prepare anything, you know, in writing or anything. This is a verbal. Um, it's what I've observed from all I don't know all of the lingo. But um, what I was generally um, concerned about was um, the setback that we have. That was my main concern. There was no, when this was all happening with the division of these four lots, personally, hey, I'm, I'm all game. I, I, I'm pro development. I like to see things go up. I was happy to say, hey, if it's a good design and everything's good and matches the community, I'm good with it. But um, when it was brought to my attention about the 6.5 meter setback, um, that didn't flow with me. That's not going to flow on the community in that area. It's just, um, mind you, now with this presentation, what was quite good, now we see a nice presentation that should have been. Uh, brought to the attention when this was all subdivided, in my opinion. Um, but uh, it looks a little more reasonable. Uh, I haven't had a look at it yet, but it hasn't been uh, circulated. But uh, I don't think there should be uh, um, this division of this property in, in the lots and for if, if there's not a proposed 
building and what it's going to look like and where it's going to go. I don't understand why they would just let that go. And I, I'm, I'm terrified that um, he's got a nice design now, but they may sell it to someone else and he puts six meters off the front of, of the roadway. And you can see, everyone can see that by that picture. Uh, that wouldn't go with the, with the community. Um, I, I certainly, and I don't think anyone in this room would want their neighbor to build a house on their front lawn. You know, it's just not good. But it could happen in this situation very easily. We have, we have a proposal now, but is that proposal going to stay? Is that set in stone for the people that buy this lot? Not likely. So um, I opposed that. And if you could put conditions to, to this, um, uh, you know, these, these rulings of how, how he wants to do this, um, yeah, that would be nice, whether you can do it or not. Um, in, in regards to the, like the, the sanitary and, the, and uh, services, I know for a fact that, that the services are in the back. There's a right away, they go down Hampton, back, back of the property. That's water, sewer, gas, and hydro. Out front, that water line was put in maybe 10 years ago um, for the fire hydrants. And that was for reasons, um, I believe, for uh, the development that was on uh, Cement Plant Road. They needed to tr create a loop for the flow of the water. And they told us at the time that we could tie into that new water line if we wanted to, you know, at our cost, of course. And then, now this was verbal, I just heard this, they were told by one of them, uh, uh, somebody in the, in the uh, city, no, you can't tie into that anymore. Uh, you would have to do an archeology span study to tie the water line across, across the road there. So um, that's fine, the water lines are in the back. So I don't know why we don't have uh, at this meeting and the developer doesn't have these engineer drawings to say that are, that they're out there. Um, I'd like to see those drawings. I don't know why we don't have these drawings here in front of us. Um, that's the mo most important thing right now. I don't care how much it costs this guy to put his sanitary or bring it in, but they, like Gary was saying, these people gotta know. I can't imagine what it would cost to bring sanitary down the front of Lakeshore Road. You gotta get an archeology span study as far as I'm concerned, as far as I know. They had a big hole dug out there for weeks digging it, just to put that that uh, wa that water line in for the, the hydrants. So this is just a big can of worms, like you say, Gary, for someone down the road, and it may it may flop back on, on, on the city. I don't know what the legal ramifications could be about that. So I mean, I, I, I oppose to, the, to this development as I see it. Um, don't know what the conclusion could be, but uh, the setback is the big one for me. Uh, I, I'd love to see four homes in there, absolutely. But uh, let's not uh, um, create a can of worms for someone. And, and the setback, like I say, I don't, I have nothing else to say, but thanks for having, listening to me. Great, great. Um, thank you to the uh, uh, presenter. Um, Eric, the, uh, I know the issue of the design of the home and, and how appropriate it looks is really not in our purview, but I want to get back to um, the setback. So what I heard you say about you know what it looked like on the screen tonight versus that. So are you still um, you're still opposed to that setback where you're now that you've seen it, you're not? Um. I, I had put something down that I wanted to say tonight that the, uh, the setback, I don't want to say, oh, I, I want the setback to be 12 meters or whatever. I don't know what it really should be, but it sh it's got to match the community. And he's got, he said like something like it's, it's a little further on the one, a few, nine meters or something. I mean, this could be acceptable. But what I had written originally, what, in my, what I wanted to discuss tonight was I want it to be reasonable. You know, I'm hoping that the committee here is, is, is the one that's going to make that decision for us, our, our, you know, the community and the residents of Port Colburn. This is a beautiful uh, strip of land. 
along Lake Shore Road. We're really proud of it. It's the only strip of land in Port Colborne that you can see the lake. You can walk along there, drive or walk along there, and you can actually see the lake. Everything else is private. So to, to try to destroy all of this, maybe not destroy, but we got to be careful about what we want on, on this trail. I'm paying big taxes like everybody else around here. And uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm concerned about the whole project. I want to make sure that it's done properly and it, it's going to suit everybody before it goes ahead and just here, it's a, here you go, it's a free, free for all. That's what it seems like. I don't like this rubber stamp stuff. Let's get some solid uh, decisions on what's going to be built there and where it's going to be built on the property. That's my, my beef here. All right, thank you. That's fair enough. Thank you. Um, to your point about setback, and here's your point about setback, with regards to every other property on that thing, they bulldozed their house and moved it up six and a half meters, probably similar to you. Just so you know. It's all zoned the same. It, there's no special zoning for this property versus the other property. Yeah. So they can all go and build up to 6.5 meters from the yeah. front property. Yeah. So you're asking for a specific, on this one, you have to take the exception where everyone else on that street tomorrow can build in front and not have to come to this meeting. Right. So then I would have to protest to the applicant's uh, There would be no applicant. Or they wouldn't need to come to this meeting at all. They just get a building permit and they can have a building So we don't need to have this meeting. No. no. We don't need to be here at all. This, this minor various thing. Did this is a rubber stamp for you guys. Is that what you're saying? I'm not saying that. <laughs> what I'm saying is we're supposed to be discussing the area of the lot, not the setbacks. Yeah. Technically not the servicing yeah. either. Yeah. That should have been discussed. That's at, See, I, I don't know the whole thing. That, that should have been discussed at the first application for the severance part. Yeah. It was denied. OLT overturned it. Yeah. Here we are. Yeah. So yeah. If, if the desire in the community, and I'm going to go a little off topic here, the desire in that community, that stretch of road, is to have a larger setback than petition the city to change the zoning specific to all of those properties so they're all the same. And now it becomes 12 meters, in which case in this property you have to comply with that as well. So but that's not the case. When they went to this meeting to get the approval, why wasn't I, why were we at? I'm, I'm not getting into the discussion of the previous application. We had a meeting here. Yeah. There was an opportunity for the public to attend. Whoever attended, attended. Whoever didn't, didn't. That, that said and done. I, we can't go backwards. I'm just saying that 6.5 is what everyone else on that street yeah. complies with, has to comply with. <clears throat> And it's never been this committee's purview to extend a variance, or to, sorry, to extend a setback. Um, our, our committee is to allow extending what is currently set by the city. Mm -hmm. And if it's good enough for all the other properties, it should be good enough for this property. Now, it's become a little odd duckling there, yep. so be it. But, so that's all I'm trying to say. All right, so that, as far as the setback, so that, that's my, I guess, two cents worth. Um, so with that, it, your time's, you can give me your 10 minutes, so um, I think we've heard all your concerns and, and we will certainly take those into consideration. Well, thank you very much Nick, for hearing me out. Thank you. Is there anyone else that wishes to speak to this application? We'll go to the gentleman at the back first, and then we can go to the gentleman with the jacket. Kendrick on 115 Lakeshore, a few more down from that house. Um, a few things. Now, wasn't the setback 10, not six and a half? Or they're asking to change it from 10 to six and a half? The, the, this particular application is simply for the lot areas. The, the requirement for the zoning is 500 uh, square meters, and they're asking for 418 square mm -hmm. meters. That's it. Yeah, so I'll get, to that. yeah, I'll get that to next, but just, like you said, you can go six and a half anywhere in town, but this was already at 10, 10 something. It was not. It's whatever the zoning is, I believe it's six and a half. Isn't that what's on Correct, the correct me if I'm wrong, just look it up. Whatever the zoning, that requirement for that zoning will apply to this property as well as every other property on that street. Yeah. There's no difference. They're not asking for a variance on this. And then I had an idea last night I came up with. If it was severed into three lots, almost triangular shaped trapezoidal, I guess, 
they could do two on Lakeshore, one on Hampton. All the lots would intersect on Hampton to have services. So you would still have three houses. The lot size would now be probably in the 500 range, like what they're shooting for. Um, and there'd be no issues with servicing up Hampton. So that would make a lot of sense. Um, the other thing for the services, I don't think anyone else mentioned, there's a storm drain that comes out. I don't know if that affects running the services across that either. Again, just to keep you on point, we're not discussing reorientating these lots that's already a settled yeah. deal by the OLT. We're just talking about the lot area. Yeah. In which okay. case they're all the same. Yeah, that's all. So I just thought it'd be a good idea, especially with all these issues. That's all. All right, thank you. I believe the gentleman in the blue jacket. Me. There's nothing for me to comment on. And yet, why wasn't I advised of this? 
that, that I don't know. Uh, that would be can address that with staff and see why. Um, that I don't know. Well, I intend to bring a proceeding to have the Ontario Land Tribunal's decision set aside in this matter and have a new hearing because I was denied my procedural right in this matter and was denied by the city. And I sent a letter to all of council today uh, where I laid that out. And I would have sent it earlier, but again, I was only provided with the OLT's decision yesterday. I was before the Human Rights Tribunal all day today. So I actually had to write the letter during the breaks during the Human Rights Tribunal proceeding. And uh, that letter, I have a copy. Okay, so can, again, can I, can I stop you there for a second? With regards to that, that sounds like it has to do with the previous proceeding and comments, which is not what we're discussing tonight. We're simply discussing the additional or reduction of the lock areas. It if you can say to that, I, I understand your position and what you plan to do, but we're here to discuss the size of the locks, period. It affects today's proceeding as well because I'm going to ask the committee to defer its decision in this matter. Because it wouldn't make any sense to make a decision in this matter because it's going to lead to, uh, to an OLT proceeding one way or another, uh, in all likelihood, anyway. We don't want parallel proceedings. We don't want me to be challenging the last OLT proceeding uh, while there's another OLT proceeding going on involving the same lots that may well be moot. The request for variance may well be moot if this provisional consent is set aside, as I expect it will be. So that's why I am addressing that at this point. Now, I also have concerns with the uh, application on the merits that I will get to. Yeah. Here to the chair. Um, I, I recognize in the normal course of business the 10 minute appeal. I think Mr. Renault has indicated something that was of value to this committee and what's the proceeding going forward. I'd ask that of the 10 minutes start now. Only because I think, I, I don't think it's fair. Now, having heard what he said, I think that was a value. And I don't think we should penalize it. So if you need a motion uh, on that, you want to start the clock now. Unless you're willing to, to rule on, on that. Everyone okay? Okay. okay. Your 10 minutes starts now. Very well, thank you. Excuse me, sorry. We're just we're going to modify the rules. I can just respond to it to save us the time. You, you will be able to respond once he's done. Okay. Now, as for the merits of the proceeding itself, of the request for variance, well, there's quite a few issues that I would like to address. One are the comments of the planning department itself. Uh, yesterday I received a copy of the planning comments with respect to this application. A lot of it is troubling, but I'll get right to what troubles me the most about it. At two different spots in the planning comments, on pages two, on, on pages three, uh, yes, page three, point three, as well as point four, it says, the reduced lot area will facilitate the creation of a new lot in the urban area. There are lots of similar size in the existing neighborhood. No, there's not. I have measured all the lots in that neighborhood. There's not a single lot that is anywhere close to 418 square meters. I don't know why that sentence appears there twice in these planning comments. To give you an idea, the smallest lot on that strip of Lakeshore Road West is the next door neighbor, 25 Lakeshore Road West. That lot is twice the size of what they're proposing here because it's the same width, it's 50 feet, it's twice as long, however. What they're proposing is basically 50 Lakeshore Road West that's cut in half. My lot is the same size as 25 Lakeshore Road West except 50% wider. It's 75 feet wide with the same depth. So it's it's 50% bigger than 25 Lakeshore Road West, and it's 300% the size of the lots that they propose to create here. Literally three times the size. The lots on the east side, including Mr. Hughes's lot, 75 feet wide as well. They're also 
300% the size of the lots that they're proposing to create here. If we look, if we want to consider Hampton Avenue, okay, there's even bigger lots there. Um, I, I believe it is 10 Hampton Avenue, to, the one directly across the road from uh, 19 Lakeshore Road West on the back end, is, o is almost 1,700 square meters. All the residential lots in that area are large, it is a low density area, it always has been, it's zoned R1 for a reason. What they're proposing is a development that barely meets the bare minimum requirements of R2 zoning. There's no R2 in that area. It's all R1. And there's a reason that it was made R1. It's intended to be low density, or lower density, I should say low density. Uh, still buy houses there. But um, if you look at even the nearest R2 zone is around the Linwood Avenue. Even Linwood Avenue, the lots are well over 600 square meters in size. And those are wartime homes. They're not big lots. We all know what they look like. There's nothing wrong with them, but they're not huge. What, he's, what they're proposing here are lots that are a third smaller than a typical R2 lot in Port Colbert, and are certainly nowhere near any R1 lot in Port Colbert. And I would challenge the planning department to say, to tell us one R1 lot in all of Port Colbert, in all of its history, that has ever been split up like this, that has ever had a so-called minor variance to permit lots as small as 418 square meters. I know the answer, it's never happened. I've looked at all the zoning maps, i looked at all the lots, there's nothing like this that's ever been done in Port Colbert. So, I have to disagree that this is a minor variance. This is rather major in nature, and the city of Port Colborne's official plan accounts for what you're supposed to do in circumstances like this. Page 184 of the city of Port Colborne's official plan, which is supposed to be followed in any applications like this, say it says at point B, in commenting to the Committee of Adjustments on a proposal requiring applications for multiple minor variances from the zoning bylaw, which is the case here, the city shall ensure that the cumulative impact of the proposed variances is considered. And if the cumulative impact of the proposed variances is not considered to be minor, it will be recommended that the proposal should proceed by way of rezoning. It would be my position, if they're trying to get this done, the appropriate way to do it would be to apply to zone this R2. Rather than try to say, well, this is still R1, it's just smaller than R1 is legally allowed to be without a variance. That would be the appropriate way to do it, but for some reason that I do not understand, they have not proceeded in that manner. Now, the very next point in the official plan says that the plan of subdivision shall be considered as the main method of providing lots in the city. And plans of subdivision, we all know what they look like, you know, those three foot wide plans that lay out what the whole neighborhood is going to be like. And there's a lot of thought put into registered plans like that. There's a lot of, um, they make sure that they comply with zoning requirements. They make sure that they're going to make a sensible, contiguous community, not this 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 patchwork, this hodgepodge that we're being asked to consider here. Have one lot in the middle of Lakeshore Road West with four basically cottages on it, certainly with the size of cottages, uh, because that's all they're going to get with a 40% lot coverage and 418 uh, square meter lots, actually rounded off from 417 and change, because that's really all they're going to get. And I agree, that is the best way to do it. Now it says, consent for land conveyances shall only be granted where they will not compromise the orderly development of land or the general public interest. And I say the general public interest weighs heavily against this particular, uh, this particular proposal. Now, same page, point D of one, of 11.7.2 under consent policies of uh, page 184. D2 says the size, configuration, and location of the proposed consent should be appropriate for the use proposed considering the municipal services available. 
Well, there's been a lot of uh, discussion about the municipal services. I'm sure that the developer <coughs> takes the position based on what they said that uh, you know engineering has had expressed no concerns about this, and that surely that services can be arranged later. That's the wrong time to do it. If there's going to be services that, if these are going intended to ever be building lots, the infrastructure and the requirements to make the infrastructure to make them buildable should be done now at this stage. Because otherwise, what could happen is the developer, uh, the moment they register those uh, the severances, which is exactly what they're going to do if the minor uh, if the minor variance here is approved, they can sell to whomever they want, and it, it, it's their problem. Uh, to deal with the uh, with the services, if people buy the front two lots on Lakeshore and realize they can't be serviced readily, uh, and the people who bought the, the back two lots don't agree to easements to get services from Hampton, the people who bought the front two lots are going to sue, and one of those defendants is going to be the city of Port Cole for purporting to create a building lot but failing to actually put the conditions in place that would create a building. Now, it's somewhat of a legal complication in the sense that the OLT, based on the limited material in front of it, it was certainly not presented with a plan to get all of these uh, lots serviced. And if it was, it it's not reflected in its decision at all or the conditions. Um, you know, they may, the developer may take the position, well, that's uh, already been dealt with the OLT. The only real condition, the only real control to see if we're as of it, as of it's now is to deny the uh, is to deny the request for the so-called minor variance, and that may well be true. But that is all the more reason why the OLT's decision uh, it needs to be challenged, and more than happy to do that. And it needs to uh, it needs to be varied. Now, point three in the same section says the lot size and proposed use of the proposed consent should conf should conform to the provisions of the zoning bylaw where applicable. It's treating lot size as uh, as being quite special. <coughs> Again, the lot size and proposed use of the proposed consent should conform to provisions of the whole zoning. <coughs> well, this doesn't. This doesn't. I mean, obviously, they're asking for a very strong lot size. A significant one, almost a 20% reduction in minimum lot size. Now the developer said that, oh well, this we, we wouldn't be here if we knew it was R1 earlier. It says it's R1 right on the zoning map. I can't imagine the developer wanting to spend seven figures on a development and not bothering to look at the zoning map first. I don't believe that they didn't know that this was R1. I think they knew about it. I think they definitely had to have known that this was R1 and they were going to have to ask for this variance at some point. Now, addressing some of the points that were made by the developer in his presentation. If I'm going to interrupt real quick, you're at the 10 minute mark, so you can try to summarize whatever you want. Yeah, my, my won't got a minute left anyway. Uh, he said that there's already an approved severance. Well, it's only provisionally approved. This committee still has the control to to stop it by denying the minor variance. Uh, he says that their proposed setbacks exceed minimum requirements, but then he acknowledged that they might just sell it to another builder who can build whatever they want. There's been no building permits applied for, there's been no blueprints tendered to this committee or shown to the public. I wish I could have seen that presentation before today. I would have analyzed it. I would have said, well, does this mean lot coverage? How big is the house? How big is the garage? How long is the driveway? One of the concerns was with such a short setback, that's probably going to be forced. Uh, you park a modern truck on the driveway, it's going to be almost out on the road. It's not going to be very good. Uh, as for a development <coughs> agreement, this is the stage to enter a development agreement, and that's right in the official plan as well. I mean, I, I don't have time to, to set the particular section, but this is the stage to enter a development agreement, not after. Not after. Um, it was said that Adam and engineering did not indicate any concerns, and so it was recommended that there be a uh, that there not be a development agreement. Well, someone not expressing concern is not good enough. They may have missed something. This committee needs the evidence before it uh, in order to make informed decisions. It just saying that oh, no one else told me that there's a problem with it. Well, that's not good enough. They need to affirmatively say 
this is where the services are coming from. This is how we're going to get it done. Not just say, well, they didn't say that we can't get it done, therefore we assume we're going to. If that was the approach we took, then this committee may as well not exist and it may as well just be city staff making those decisions uh, directly without any oversight by this committee. So um, there's quite a lot else I'd like to say, but obviously I'm limited for time. Uh, in summary, I, I absolutely oppose this application as it is uh, as it's structured. And, and, and frankly, if the developer wanted to get the best uh, development out of this, what they should do is create three lots running both ways, all the way from Lakeshore to Hampton. That solves the servicing problem, that solves the setback problem, because no one's going to ram a, a house up to 6.5 meters to create a very small front yard on Lakeshore and a big one on Hampton. That doesn't make any sense because nobody else has done that. It would look terrible. And uh, it would also comply with minimum lot size requirements of our one zone, whereas this proposal is not. So thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you. Does the uh, applicant want to address any of those comments? Through the chair, uh, yes. Obviously, thank you to everyone for the comments. I have some bullet points here. I'll, I'll run through kind of addressing each one. Uh, heard setbacks, we've addressed that. This is for lot area. But just to clarify, whatever the minimum is, like if you have to be 6.5 back or whatever it is, we're beyond that. We're, we're, we're more than the minimum. So that, I just want to address that. Um, engineering drawings, etc. In terms of circulation, uh, you know, not everyone's a P engineer or a civil tech, so uh, you know, you, you got to rely on the professionals. Uh, but yeah, we do have engineering drawings, we do have cross sections from the city, so we know that it is serviceable. Uh, so yeah, I just want to make sure that's addressed. There's something about archaeology. Uh, don't need to get into the details of that, but I have worked on other projects that have required archaeology. Uh, a road is a disturbed area, so that wouldn't uh, apply. But anyway, the city can address that if they wish. Um, three lots, extending uh, road to road. Uh, it is a design consideration, but that squeezes your widths by 33% instead of my proposed 50%. Uh, you're gonna have narrow Toronto houses. <coughs> We're trying to go with a proper fit that aligns with the streetscape and everything with this area. Uh, someone mentioned storm drain. Yep, that's been considered in our design, uh, creating a drainage plans. Uh, something I tried to address was with regard to not being notified of the Ontario Land Tribunal. So the previous application was severance or lot creation. Bill 23 addresses lot creation differently than a minor variance. Third parties, to my understanding, cannot appeal lot creation under Bill 23, which is probably why you weren't notified. Uh, my recommendation, of course, is to not defer OLT. They've seen my design. They've seen my video. It's been approved. Um, but yes, it, it is a provision, provisional approval based on me getting my minor variance. Of course, we're deficient. That is the function of a minor variance, is it's a it's to reduce the zoning requirement. In this case, 500 to 418 meters squared lot area. Um, comparing to existing lots in the neighborhood, a neighborhood is not restricted to a street, um, so you got to have a broader approach and understanding. As for lot size, um, we can't build 100 foot lots or 50 foot lots anymore, economically and um, affordability wise. We meet R1, uh, apart from this minimum lot area, which is the purpose of this minor variance application, and we meet the official plan designation for low density. <coughs> Low density is calculated by number of units per hectare. We comply with that. So we're low density with this development. Um, subdivisions uh, are for applications creating more than four lots, including retained land. So creation of three plus retained. That's why this isn't a subdivision. Um, it's too technical. I just want to focus on the minor variance. I, I see that we stray a lot. Um, I understand the concerns, but you know, I think people need to rely more on city staff who do this day in, day out. They know the terms and they know how things work and they know the relations and the names of applications. But um, 
The serviceability, again, the site is serviceable. There's no burden on the municipality of servicing is not present. Maybe a different story if it wasn't physically serviceable, but it is, we've confirmed that with the city. Think just like a cottage with no rural infrastructure at all. What, a person building their cottage is gonna sue the city because there's no pipe there? No, it doesn't work like that. Um, zoning R1 versus R2, did we know? I thought it was R1 at the beginning. Zoning policies change all the time. Perfect, uh, perfect example was Secretary Treasurer at the beginning of this meeting had to stipulate the zoning we're referencing. Changes all the time. Um, public analysis, uh, again, is appreciated, but I rely on municipal staff uh, with direct information uh, and trust that the planning recommendation report to approve this is satisfactory. Thank you. Um, thank you, thank you for the, the rebuttal. I did want to, what struck me about um, this um, post your consent application was that you're not back for a variance. And sitting around here for a number of years, in fact, even the planning fees um, contemplate um, not a large, but a discount for developers doing their consent and step and step their consent and their variance at the same time. So my question is why didn't you choose that route? Uh, sorry, just to confirm, are you asking me why I didn't initially apply for a co combined application? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, because we were told we didn't need a minor variance at time <coughs> application. Or else I would have. And, and for reference that is how this is being treated as a result of that error. Uh, and just last question. Um, I mean, we were, construction season has already started. When, when, was, when was your desire to start this project? Uh, right now, we do have occupants, tenants, so we're going to work with them. But, um, you know, interest rates are changing all the time. Uh, it's hard to say, okay. but um, sure. as soon as the market makes sense. Thank you, this one will happen. Is there anyone else from the public that wishes to speak to this application this evening? Not seeing anyone else. Um, I think you, you gave a, a rub ball. I don't know if you have anything further you want to add after that, but okay. any other questions or comments of committee members? Thank you um, to our chief planner. You may not be able to answer any of these questions we're about to answer. Um, perhaps. My concern was the last comment was that there was an error caused that delay and why the consent and uh, uh, invariance came at different times. I'm also not sure that uh, Mr. Renault's application to overturn because he didn't have notice and, and from a process issue would necessarily change the outcome of the evidence presented if he was there, but it may. And, and to that end, it seems that uh, it's sensible that to grant a, as I asked the question about your starting point, to um, to get some legal advice on, you know, the value of permitting a variance when the whole thing could be overturned. I don't know the realm of possibility. I don't know the ramifications of approving a, a um, variance when we already know there may be an issue with the consent, at least on a process basis. And to that end, I'd like to open discussion to my colleagues, but I'd like to find out all those things that you can answer them, but I would much prefer getting some legal advice before taking the next step and not knowing all the potential ramifications of going forward when we're now aware of what we're aware of. So I don't know, Denise, if you can take a stab at any of that. That's not appreciate it. Um, there's nothing in the planning act that requires us to provide notice of a hearing. 
there's a sign-in sheet that indicates if you would like notice of decision from the committee that we would provide that. There is nothing in the planning act that indicates that we have to provide notice of a hearing. Uh, we are not required to circulate notice of a hearing. Uh, there's, there's no requirements on the city's end. Uh, if the tribunal, or uh, generally it's if the uh, applicant or the appellant's lawyer asks us for a list to circulate, we provide that to them and they do the circulation. If planning staff and the city are on the same side, then we get direction from the Ontario Land Tribunal to send out a notice. Uh, so in this instance, uh, we did not receive any direction from the OLT, to my knowledge, to send out any notice to any members of the public regarding this hearing. So I'm, I'm a little bit perplexed in terms of the uh, misstep, uh, in terms of what we, what we missed there. No, that was just on the when I asked the question. Sorry, when I asked the question about the uh, to the developer, why we didn't do both at the same time. His oh, answer oh, was we, so I think to the chair of the committee member, there is absolutely no legal ramification. Um, there was a my understanding there was a miscommunication in terms of the zoning. I think one one paper indicated one zone, but then there was additional conversations to clarify that. So without being a lawyer, um, I do not see any any uh, ramifications to a uh, miscommunication in terms of what the zoning is. But it's sure, constant sure. conversations uh, with developers in terms of what they need to apply for, uh, what the proposals are. So I'm, I'm not, um, if that's what you're getting at, uh, committee member. I should have been clear. Um, the process that uh, Mr. Renault talked about, about so you're saying that his ability to get noticed that he was here. So the chair of this and David didn't talk. But I don't know whether he could have had status if he asked for it. Um, maybe the chair does, or you do. My only concern is that when you're unsure, and I'm unsure of what would happen if his if he appeals the lack of the process, not the content, and so therefore we go back to the beginning. If that it's really worth approving tonight this issue, when we should explore what that can do. You're saying it's nothing. I wasn't looking at this from a strictly planning act point of view. I was looking at it his ability to have status if he could have had status and not a notification. What you're saying is there's no requirement to have that, correct? 100%. So there's, there's no requirement that we notify um, any any residents or anyone involved in the process of, of the hearing. Uh, to that point, if somebody knows about it and, and proceeds to, to request party status, if they can, um, then they have that option. Uh, it, it's a little bit of an, an interesting situation when the committee turned it down. Only the only the uh, uh, applicant can appeal that that decision. Okay. But can they, can somebody else seek party status? Perhaps. Uh, I'm not a lawyer in that sense, but I did want to speak to. I do not see anything that we did wrong in due process of providing uh, notice. Through the chair, just to elaborate my experience with the recent OLT, uh, law creation uh, cannot be appealed by even third party uh, per Bill 23. That's my understanding. And I'll concur with that. Unless there's an extremely <coughs> exceptional condition as to why they whatever, but they have to apply it. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Through you to, uh, I think, to Ms. Landry, um, I, I, I'm really quite confused and uh, really kind of surprised because I also was under the impression that when people signed in here uh, and left their name and their contact information, that meant that they would be contacted in all, for uh, all steps in the process. Um, uh, that was my understanding of what you're saying tonight is it is not at all. 
Um, I think that from now on, we should make it incredibly clear as to exactly what the signature on that list means, because I do believe we're misleading the public. And if I was just a regular member of the public, didn't have any understanding of what's going on in these proceedings, walked in for my first time, and I heard, you know, sign back there, you're going to be made aware of what's going on, we'll get a hold of you when, when something's happening. Um, I'm going to expect that anything at all that has to do with that property, I'll get notified about it. So I think that expectations and reality of things are, are a little bit different here. So maybe we can start making that incredibly clear uh, because I feel like we mis mislead people and that's the wrong way to do things. Absolutely the wrong way. That just like a comment on, on the, if the process says you don't have to apply, you don't have to re uh, let people know that you don't, but I, I also am a, a firm believer that just because you're not required doesn't mean you shouldn't do it. So there's that as well. Um, I think that those things, should, maybe we should be looking at some changes in our, in our practice. Um, um, yeah, you can, I've got more of it. Go ahead. Uh, through, through the Chair's Committee member, uh, we did confirm the, the sign-in sheet indicates very clearly to please sign up if you would like the notice of decision of the Committee of Adjustment. There's nothing on that um, that indicates that you will be provided any additional information. As once, once something is appealed, it's, it's, it's out of the City's hands, it's in the OLT's hands. So if the OLT directs us to do something, uh, there's a provincial level, we do it. But aside from that, it's now no longer staff's or council or committee's um, file. Okay. Thank you. And I do understand that. Uh, but I'm saying as a member of the public coming in to a proceeding that you've never been at before, you're not going to stand there and read everything that's on that list that you're signing. You've just been directed to go put your name there and you're going to get notified of things. That's what you're going to do. You're not going to read what you're, what you're signing. You're just going to put your name down. So I, I just think that we should make a point of telling everyone this is what it means. It doesn't mean any more than that. And I do believe that we should consider doing more than what's required. But it's not a bad thing to consider. Um, the other thing I, I, I would like to have it really well known as to who makes the decision um, about whether the city will defend the decisions of the, of the uh, Committee of Adjustment because that is an all, another thing that gets confusing to the public as well. They need to know, how did that happen? How did we deny something? And then it goes to the OLT and no one defends our decision, and there it goes. So who makes that decision and how does that process happen? That may help this evening. Uh, through the chair, to the committee member. So because Committee of Adjustment is, is a body of council, they are appointed by council, it is council's uh, prerogative and decision-making power uh, whether they send a representative to defend the Committee of Adjustment's decision. So it is their, it is their uh, right and inability to, to decide whether or not they will send a representative or not. Okay, thank you. And as, as a former member of council for many, many years, I don't ever remember being asked if we should uh, be defending something. <coughs> so maybe council does make that decision, but there are council members right here tonight where you asked you whether this should be defended. I don't think it works. So um, right. that's yes. Yeah, Respectfully, but <laughs> through, through the chair, that is 100% of the process. It is an in-camera conversation where that conversation is, is not public, but the decision to not send uh, a representative is um, is a public uh, decision. Okay. I understood entirely, and I'm not discussing particulars. I'm just saying, you know, these are these are uh, understandings that staff may have that doesn't maybe necessarily happen in reality, and the public would have yet a different understanding. And the whole process gets quite confused, and there's a lot of finger pointing in the end. And I think we could clear things up by just very clearly stating things when you sit down to, to, to do something. It just makes more sense. Anyway, thank you. That's all. I got that off my chest, which I really didn't need to do because it's been bothering me for quite some time. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Any questions or comments? I was just wondering because we gave the applicant uh, a second chance. Mr. Nori, respond to you. Well, if you want to right. make a motion to allow him to do that, that's your prerogative. It's oh, yeah. decision, but oh, the yeah. right, right general rule is that they have the 10 minutes. She their feedback and well, we had one and then one comment, and then we had yeah, the apple uh, always had come back right. without it without a request to have a vote on it. The so I'll make a motion that we vote on it. I'll second that. Okay, all in favor to, just to allow the 
Oh, that's, that's, yeah. 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 I go back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Yeah. That's it. Just, right? Okay. That's there's one, one, there's two volume, one volume. Yeah. Two tunes, and it's a story. And the duration is the uh, Five minutes. Okay. Uh, uh, Yes, five minutes will, will be plenty. I wanted to clarify a couple of things uh, because I think people had had the wrong impression based on some of the comments that were said. There was a reference to a, a sign-up sheet. The committee of adjustment meeting that happened on January 17th was virtual only. I, wa I wanted to come here, but I was told that it was uh, going to be virtual only, so I never saw a sign-up sheet. I was going based on what it says in the notice of hearing itself, which, which again, I'll read it. If you wish to be notified of the decision of the Committee of Adjustment in respect to this application, you must submit a written request to the Secretary of Treasurer, which I did in, in, by an email, which, which she received and acknowledged receiving it. And then the next sentence is, this will also entitle you to be advised of a possible Ontario Land Tribunal here. So based on that wording alone, I should have been advised of an Ontario Land Tribunal hearing. In addition to that, in my email, I also specifically asked to be advised if uh, an appeal to the Ontario Land Tribunal was filed so I could deal with it. But I wasn't. Um, I agree that it's not an explicit requirement in the Planning Act itself or the regulations there under that a member of the public be provided with such notice. As, and I know because I, I reviewed the Planning Act in detail to see if it's in there. It is not a very well drafted piece of legislation, by the way. It is Byzantine. Uh, but I confirm that, yes, it's not an explicit requirement, but the moment the city says it's going to do so, the city is bound to do so. Uh, it's, a, it's a matter of procedural <coughs> If the city says it's going to let me know, the city has to do it or else it's, it's violating the base, very basic principles of procedural fairness. Um, even so the city could take the position no we're not going to inform members of the public of appeals to the ontario land tribunal it, if that's the case the city should say that but if the city says it's going to inform them if they sign the sign up sheet or uh, email the secretary of treasury it's bound to do that so so i hope that clarifies that matter Does that make sense? Does anyone have any questions for me while I'm up here? On any of that? Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much.
So there wasn't a separate minor variance application at that time? Correct. But it was a condition, the staff's recommendation that a condition be added to the consent to have that passed before the consent would proceed. That's why the provisional and the OLT accepted that same report, and that's how they made their decision. Then they don't meet the condition of the uh, provisional consent. Correct. Just for clarity, did it reference it needed? Because it, it, did it reference it needed a variance application? It's, it, it's a condition of the consent that an application be granted because it does not comply with the current zone. So pending a variance. Exactly. Just like we do on a lot of consents that there's variances. Sometimes they're together, sometimes they're not. <coughs> but that's, what, sorry. Like, that's what I was drawing the distinction. That's why I asked the question of why it wasn't in the first place. So, so for example, if it was uh, hypothetically together, Mr. Renault or the objectors would be here he would just do his objection through the process of not getting proper notice. All the things he said in his initial presentation. If he wants this overturned, he's got to do it separately. It's not by the city, it's a process issue. It's not a planning uh, decision. I'm not sure what you're trying to say. So, so where I'm going with that is it. So the, the consent's been granted. Provision. Provision. He's going to try, potentially try and overturn that for all the reasons he, he gave. So, but if they had been together, uh, he wouldn't have gotten notice. Well, if they were all been done, the same process would have happened. Just that if we denied everything, the old he would have heard everything and would have granted a decision based on. That's what I'm saying. We want to be here tonight with all of this. Yeah. Okay. Very well, maybe. Yeah. Or maybe not. Just, just like it's not private. Just wanted to see what you're doing. Any other questions? Yeah. Yeah. Recommendation? I think in 
some cases, I don't know what I don't know. <laughs> and that's why I would like to tell the whole story of what we've heard here tonight, because I easily could miss something that happens to be the only issue that might be seen. What it, um, would, I might suggest that we see if the city's lawyer or another one of the lawyers from that firm would be available to attend the meeting to answer any questions. Let me find you. do let 
the two lawyers talk, and then we decide whether it's a case. So to sum it up, I would uh, ask for the um, uh, adjournment, um, and um, happy to let the chief planner decide how to distribute uh, one of the uh, objectors' opinion to our lawyer. And if they can sort it out ahead of time, great. If not, as stands, they can come to the next year. Just, just for a point of clarity in our typical procedure, because we've passed the public input stage, mm -hmm. if we do bring the uh, lawyer back or they provide some sort of report or whatever, it's not going to be a, an open discussion between a, a public member and a lawyer to, to hash out what the legalities of this are. It's going to be us asking the lawyer for some questions or if they provide a report for you. Um, just for clarity from our perspective, the public's had their say. We're obviously taking their comments into consideration. And at the end of the day, it's going to come, we're either going to grant or we're going to deny. Um, so I'd like to we, we can, we can, I, I don't have necessarily a objection to delaying. We've done this in the past to get further clarity. And um, if that makes us give a better decision, I'm, I'm all for that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Actually, uh, through to the rest of the committee members, I would personally be happy if we had our lawyer view this table to tonight's proceedings and then give us some kind of a report, some kind of a Written advice, that would be fine. It doesn't, they don't have to be here, you know, fielding our questions. Um, that first of all is quite toxic, and second, it's probably not, not necessary. I think we laid out a lot of our concerns and we're all brought up quite clearly within this uh, proceeding. So if they just view the proceedings and give some advice, I'd be happy with that. Now, I will say with regards to that, and whatever we get from counsel, if you get, they're not going to give us a recommendation whether you should grant or not, just, I mean, just to be clear. Um, the, the clarity is just to say whether the person in question had would have had standing at the OLT if they were. Just to avoid the okay. that's all. So I, I guess just to, to staff, um, Denise, mm -hmm. you're clear on what the Gary's ask is as far as getting some clarity of. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. You're, you're, you're right about viewing the tape. But in case the objector had other points that could be fed in through to be written, why not? Why not get that? Because what we're saying then is, Denise has captured everything. I didn't capture everything. Sure, reviewing the the tape was, but I, I think there's if the, if the applicant has three or four questions, why wouldn't? Well, it, it'll end, my concern is it's going to become a free. Sorry. My concern is going to become a free for all. And you're just going to have everybody everything's going to be flying. And that's not what we need to do. We just need clarifications on some of the points that were brought up tonight, I think. And the rest is up to us. You know, we've heard from the public. We're armed to make the decision. We just need to, to know, you know, a few of the legal points to make sure that we're not going to open the city up to something or ourselves up to something in the future because we need a decision on this really want to edit. I want to do that. Uh, I want to make sure that we're just on the right track and that we have all the right little bits of information. So I don't really want it to be, um, you know, everybody take pot shots and everything. There's all kinds of questions flying. It just gets out of control like that. We don't need to do that. I guess to explain that, Claire, I wouldn't want at the next meeting uh, an objector to stand up and say, well, that's not exactly what I said, or that's not what I said. So if, if, uh, if, uh, if, it, if it creates Brevity, I can live with. All right, so with that, if there's no other questions or comments, the motion on the floor is to adjourn to next month, seeking some advice from the council through the city. So with that, if there's no other questions or comments, all those in favor, I'll be here. We'll stand adjourned on this application until next month. Just a reminder to committee members that we cannot discuss amongst ourselves um, or the applicants or any members of the public. <coughs> um, until next week. Thank you. All right. Perfect. So with that being said, um, the next uh, is other business.
anyone have any other business? No, I actually do. Um, and two, some of the comments that were raised this evening. Um, I, I, I do take part. Oh, yeah, they did. No, I just didn't know what they were Yeah, that they had the option. Yeah, no, they um, so, so what I would like to do, based on the comments that were received today, um, to potentially discuss amongst ourselves about notice. Um, and, and quite frankly, I'm, I think it's a little bit more than just the committee. We may have to talk to staff, um, secretary treasurer, um, and the whole reasoning behind it. Um, I, I am leaning towards changing my opening monologue, for lack of a better word, um, to remove the notice of OLT hearings. And quite frankly, I've been thinking about that for quite a while for the simple fact that third parties do not have standing at OLT hearings. Um, so we can just leave it as, if you want a notice of decision, the notice of decision will be given. I don't know if it's always been that way written in the bylaw or the planning act that we um, are required to give notice or not of OLT hearings or OMB hearings back in the day. Um, I think it's always been our practice to do that. Um, so that, I think that's maybe where the discussion needs to be had. Um, and like I said, I think that's maybe a little bit beyond because now we're technically asking staff to do potentially that's something above and beyond the community adjustment. I don't know. Yep. Um, but um, Maybe we can ask uh, Denise if you can kind of look at that and maybe make a recommendation to us. We, I don't think we necessarily need to do it uh, at a hearing. We can do it outside of that. Yeah. Um, the only thing that we're bound to talk about in public is hearings. Um, as far as our procedures and um, protocols and stuff, um, that's for us to decide as long as we can summarize at the end what the rules of our community are and how we're going to proceed. I know Eric uh, earlier brought up uh, asking about if we had a procedural um, bylaw for this committee or not, and I don't believe we do. We only have the, um, I think in terms of reference, I believe is the way it's worded, for this committee. Um, we had talked about it in the past, but I don't think we ever got here. I think we did make a procedural council. I'm not too sure. My understanding is that the procedure bylaw, the one procedure bylaw that we have governs council as well as as committees of council. So it addresses uh, yeah, council and it applies to all committees, right? Yeah. Yes. I'm going to ask Heather because I do believe I think we started to draft one, one because it, it, it does go back quite a ways. I know we had yes. talked about drafting one specifically. It's more like just a, a best practice sort of thing. Yeah. The only thing I remember I don't is know that the answer that was going to be your poster. That, that was going to be her first one. She was going to go through all the committee that could be right to make my decision. I thought it was one first. So, anyway, I, I just bring that up that um, maybe we can look at that. If there's a draft, we can bring forward and we can discuss amongst ourselves and staff and see what's appropriate and what's not. I think it might clarify a lot of things going forward with regards to that. I really like your idea that it's an it's interesting you were thinking about it, but it kind of came to a head tonight. We might as well. I mean, the, the monologue, the protocol, it's probably been around forever, and lots has changed, perhaps even these places. So we should be in line, but I think also we should, uh, by saying that we're putting extra work on the staff to ensure all that happens, right? Well, we, we could, a lot of this. A lot of this we could certainly recommend ourselves and, and want something up to make it a lot easier for staff to just give the nod. Yeah, we should be heard in there. We, we can certainly do that, and I, and I did mention there before the meeting that if he has a draft from somewhere that he's okay. familiar with, we can maybe start with that. And maybe some of us can reach out to some more contacts and yeah. grab something. Yeah. So that's all I have under other business. Um, I know we also got circulated the minutes of our. Can I just continue, Mr. Jones? Sorry, yes. I thought where we were going with this is Ms. Knight. I've certainly been mentioned other members of the committee. Um, 
your emails have been poignant and more frequent than in years past. And I think members have to discuss that um, there's been errors or oversights. I don't know what one would want to say the norm is. Um, and so I'm not so sure if, if you want to um, address it. Like, I don't know like what the benchmark would be. Um, certainly we've got a lot of change in staff um, and that, but um, it seems that we're having more um, corrections on you potentially not the fact that like you've read Dan, Dan's emails. Um, I, I sit back because I, even all the years I've been here, I've not read everything the way Dan is. I'm not familiar with the planning. Yeah. It's not a requirement of being on this committee, but it seems to me that some of them are small, medium-sized, and large, and I don't know if, from your past experience, if um, this is what normally happens, because I don't have any terms of reference. <laughs> I don't, I, I do, I, I, I just wanted, because we've all talked about it, so I'll be the person who <laughs> says what other people have been thinking. Sure, so through the chair to the committee members. Of course, there's different staff, um, learning processes, statutory requirements, you know, the public asking or an applicant asking for additional variance, but then it's kind of a, a learning piece in terms of, you know, that means you've got to reissue notice, um, kind of the messaging to the applicant. So it's, of course, there's a lot involved with the committee and reviewing the applications. Uh, we have, uh, Tia and I have uh, implemented new approach to taking in applications. As uh, Taya has noted, a lot of the applications have been submitted and the submission material and the requests for what you're wearing are just not there. Um, mm -hmm. It's understandable. The public doesn't, doesn't, of course, most of them do this for the first time in a long time in their life. And so it's not an easy process. So now we're sitting down with every applicant and we're going over the material and we're saying, okay, what variances do you think you need? And, and some of them are like, I have no idea. And so we help them walk them through it. We can't fill out the application form for them, but we can guide them for what they're asking. So we have done that. We actually recently had an individual who's applied and had done this many times. They had indicated and was very certain of the variance they needed. We found another variance. Of course, every bylaw is different and there's lots of complications. So we're hopeful and um, I think it will be a, a great a new approach to ensuring that we are addressing uh, all of those kind of pieces. My biggest concern, my biggest concern was back in the day, anybody that's been on this committee is back in the facts from the conservation authority or the facts from the region that would have same day on it or the day before. And so my concern is, is everything come to a head at the end while you're floating through four applications? Because if I can remember when Heather Pond his job, like stuff was coming in like that morning, uh, and I imagine the stuff that would make the report probably, <laughs> you'd love to write the report like three or four days early, but you can't. Um, and I don't know if that's gotten any better. It was predominantly the region um, and in Yeah, yeah. 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 That is definitely a tricky piece, just as that one um, committee member, Thorgard Bar, brought up about the NPCA's comments, and we didn't receive them until the day that um, the Secretary of Treasury issues the APA agenda. For the most part, uh, the region is, is good. Uh, we also have implemented this process where we receive an application and the Secretary of Treasury sends it out to the region right away and says, do you, do you need fee and do you have any initial concerns? Mm -hmm. So that we can, they can start to review it. We do that with the MPCA. The MPCA has been under staff for quite some time. They're, they get staff, they leave, they get staff, they leave. So it's quite difficult, but we are working with them to hopefully get comments sooner. And things are getting better, but there's still some situations where we 
get them uh, late. But yes, there has been many a conversation with planners in the office when we're preparing a report and comments are coming in and of course you're reviewing policies and a new policy pops up and we're debating on okay, how are we going to, to look at this policy. So yes, there's lots of pieces that are in the air that we're, that we're constantly looking at to assess the applications. I think most of this don't know all the time does. And so when I see the amount of planning applications that comes in for draft plans and subdivisions, apartment buildings, kind of, like it's, a, it's, it's a number we've never seen in the history of Port Coburn. And so I'm thinking that that also probably gets in the workflow mix. I will uh, say that Dan is very good at reviewing our applications. And I did, I did thank him too with the, the legal description of the last one. Yeah, we, we are looking to make sure that we find tooth comb everything as well. Just double check, um, triple dot our eyes and cross our teeth uh, to hopefully address uh, no concerns. We, when we do notice something, often we are able to recirculate because we have enough time to say, oh, there was something reason of notice. Ideally, that doesn't happen and we can catch everything uh, in time and not after we do We have lots going on, but we always are striving.